Hello, Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Opening schools has become so complicated that planners don't know whether to multiply, divide, add, or subtract. All that is certain is that the controversy has no time for recess. Meanwhile, the governor this week said not so fast to hopes of moving on to another phase. We'll be looking at these stories as well as an increase in shootings, a look at the police and jail consent decrees, what's needed for an economic comeback, and the Pelicans in the playoffs. Joining us are tonight's informed sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, Gordon Russell, Managing Editor for Investigations, The Times-Picayune, The New Orleans Advocate, Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter, and Mike Perlstein, Investigative Reporter, WWL-TV, Channel 4. And we're going to go over to Gordon first for our latest update on COVID statistics and how we're looking, what the governor has to say. Sure. I mean, it's a little bit all over the map, I guess I would say. The big picture is it's been pretty discouraging. Louisiana, as you all probably know, has the highest uh, rate of positive tests in the country on a per capita basis. So that's sort of the big picture. Um, that's obviously not good. Uh, the, the bigger the, the bigger picture has been that, you know, the, the virus has spread all over the state. So this more recent uptick has been mostly in other parts of Louisiana, not in New Orleans and Jefferson Parish as much. Um, the good news in the, the good recent news, I would say, is that uh, there's been sort of a plateau. We were having a real explosion of cases, and we're still having at least a thousand new uh, positive test results a day in the last couple of weeks. But the number has been trending in the right direction. Um, and the governor today announced, you know, said that there had been modest progress. Um, most parts of the state seem to have plateaued, and some are uh, more than half, I think, are on a decrease now. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is, you know, we plateaued at a fairly high level, mm -hmm. and it's not like this thing is anywhere close to extinguished. Um, so the governor also announced that we're going to remain in phase two for another three weeks at least. Um, and that's sort of where we've been stuck for, um, over two months now. And uh, there's no sign that we're coming out of that anytime soon. Um, so there's, that's, you know, the big picture on cases, um, we're, we're seeing, I would say there's been of uh, fatalities, as you know, always kind of trail cases. And we've seen another, you know, we've seen an increase in deaths um, over the past couple of weeks uh, as a result of all these new cases. But it has not been as bad as the first spike in the virus early on uh, in terms of the total numbers of deaths. But it's it's pretty discouraging, too. Um, and w another trend I wanted to mention is that um, with hospital, th mm -hmm. th it was a pretty worrisome look there for the hospital beds were getting quite full. And in the last week or so, we've seen the, the number of hospitalized people come down a good bit, not a tremendous amount, but by a couple of hundred, which is a, which is a good sign and a sign that hopefully the deaths won't be as, you know, the, that sort of a sign that there's going to be more deaths coming when you see a lot of hospitalizations, and hopefully that's a good sign. Yeah, I know that um, definitely is a measure that that is closely looked at, certainly along with the deaths, but also the hospitalizations. So we are seeing that starting to kind of come down a little bit because for a while there, it, it had really come down and then it tripled. Yes, it was very scary, and it's um, it's it's somewhat better in the last last few days or over the last week, um, which is a good thing. But I wouldn't say it's time to uh, celebrate, you know, mission accomplished or anything. But it's the trend lines are good, and and along with the trends in cases and so forth, hopefully it's a, it's again a sign that we're making some progress. But as the governor said today, not a sign that we're ready necessarily to reopen everything either. Gordon, what happened the first time when things seemed to be going well, then there was a sudden reversal? What happened, and what did we learn from that so there won't be another reversal? Well, I mean, it's I'm sure many books and whatnot will be written about this over time, but my sense of what happened was that there was, you know, Louisiana is a big place, and there was different things going on in different parts of the state, and we had a terrible crisis around New Orleans, and you know, Saint, you know, from New Orleans to Jefferson and St. Tammany Parish. But the rest of the state really didn't have a big crisis. And so 
this was kind of something they were reading about and hearing about on the news. And I don't think it was taken as seriously. And I think you see this in a lot of the country, places like Texas and Florida that didn't have large early outbreaks and then have more recently had really serious outbreaks. Um, so I think it almost takes, it seems to me that it almost takes this happening in your community for you, for folks to really get their heads around it and that this is something they have to adapt to and be very careful and do all the things that we're always being told to do, you know, wear masks and wash your hands and try not to make a lot of unnecessary trips and, you know, try to stay out of tight indoor spaces with other people and all those kinds of things. So people expected And I, I think it, that didn't happen. Yeah. Sorry. I would say people expected it for New Orleans, but not for their neighborhood. Um. Well, I think it just moved into the rural areas more. We've seen, um, you know, over these past weeks where the rural areas perhaps hadn't been hit by it so hard at the very beginning, but it's moved more there. Yeah, I mean, places in, in, in the smaller cities, especially, I think, where there's enough of a critical mass of people for the virus to do a lot of damage, but that didn't get hit badly. Like Lake Charles is a really is having a lot of coronavirus now, high infection rates and a lot of deaths. And that was a place that wasn't really, was barely touched in the first phases of this. And so testing, Gordon, um, you know, Louisiana was really doing well with testing. We were having problems for a while there because, because of the materials, really, that were needed for testing. But now mm -hmm. we've had locations called surge testing. How is that moving along? Well, I mean, I think the big complaint about testing is not so much that we don't have enough testing capacity. I mean, we're doing a lot of testing, but it's the rate, you know, it's the speed of the tests is really the complaint you hear the most. And that it, they can take a week or longer still. And that's very frustrating both to the people who are being tested and the people who are trying to pay attention to the spread of the virus because by the time a week has passed, you know, you may have infected half a dozen people or more. Um, so you almost have to treat it as though you have the virus. Um, and then you'll find out later whether you did have the virus or not. Right. That's, I think, I think in terms of the actual testing, I mean, it's still good to have the data eventually. It's just that it's not giving us very good real-time data. Well, all of this, of course, is spilling over into every facet of our lives, including schools, which is on everybody's mind right now because we're anxious to get our kids back in school, and this is the start of the new school year. Um, but there's still a lot of unknowns about that. We're going to move over to Dawn to talk about that and give us an update of how we're looking with that. Well, we are we are there. We are at the start of the school year, either this week, next week, or the week that follows. Nearly every school within the metro area will be open in some fashion. In some fashion is the key word. St. Charles Parish was the first regional parish to open schools. They did that this week on Thursday, um, and they're opening in a staggered system. So far, reports are relatively good out of St. Charles Parish, um, but they're, they're new in their school year. K through eight students there are going every day. High school students are going every other day. Um, Catholic schools are opening individually. Several Catholic schools on the North Shore actually opened this week. Um, several more will roll out next week. Orleans Parish is the largest district in our area that has opted to start completely virtually. They will be starting, actually some schools could have started as early as this week. Most will start next week, virtual only. They will be revisiting how the numbers look at the end of August to decide maybe to go in person in a hybrid kind of situation after Labor Day. St. Tammany Parish has delayed till after Labor Day, but the big hot issue right now is Jefferson Parish, where there was a very heated debate, heated board meeting this week. Um, Jefferson Parish President Cynthia, Cynthia Lee Shang has asked the school district to delay their start until after Labor Day and let the numbers go down a bit more. The school board has said they are going to start next week. Um, that question is still up in the air, whether or not there will be a change. That start would be in person for the younger kids, pre-K through fourth grade, and then a hybrid situation again with two days on and three days on rotating systems for the kids in fifth through 12th grade. So that's a, a really big question uh, that still remains out there. Will they or won't they open next week? St. Bernard Parish also opening next week in a staggered kind of start. All of these starts, Marcia, require parents really, really, really to be paying attention. And I'm just going to run you down something that St. Bernard's doing to just highlight how confusing it can be for parents. The K through eight students, kindergarten through eighth grade students in St. Bernard Parish will start next week. 
on Tuesday, the students whose last names begin with A through D will start. Wednesday, it's E through K. Thursday, L through Q. Friday, like you really have to pay attention to who's doing mm-hmm. what, what days, rotating by last name, rotating by school system. It is all very, very different. There is, however, I think a, kind of a silver lining in everything that's happening with this craziness within the schools. One is every district I've, I've reached out to and talked to is working on technology and making sure kids have access to Chromebooks or whatever technology they have. So this one-to-one ratio for children and learning that we've talked about for years is actually happening because of COVID. So maybe that's a good thing that the kids will have access to the internet and access to online learning. The other thing that's happening is because the, because of the phase we're in and the fact that groups have to be smaller, class sizes are being reduced. Mm-hmm. So your student to teacher ratio that had maybe gone out of whack in some districts has really been forced to come back down because of this. Um, so maybe there are some silver linings in the COVID situation. The delays in starting and revisiting whether or not we start after Labor Day, say in St. Tammany, mm-hmm. where they're not starting virtual learning or any kind of learning till after Labor Day, the delays by the state are allowed to go on until October if need be, so long as a district gets in the required 177 days. So this question mark of when they'll start, if they'll start, it, it, it just keeps getting pushed down the road in some of these districts. And, of course, you know, parents, of course, are very concerned about this, but so are teachers. I mean, teachers are concerned about their personal safety. That's the problem. That's what's happening with the Jefferson Parish teachers. We don't, we're not sure it's safe for us to go to school. They, they went back to work, and then several people tested positive. Um, it's a question across the board. Teaching is going to be hard, whether it's in person or whether it's online. Some teachers are older and worried about their safety that way. Some teachers are younger and worried about, well, what happens if I don't launch this new career I'm in? It's a mess, and I don't think it's clearing up. You know, and we've talked about this before, how parents feel. Kind of damned if you do, damned Mm. if you don't. You're judged across the board. Do you do you not love your children if you want to send them to school? Are you not worried about their health? Or do you love your children if you want to send them? It's it's a crazy world out there, and all of the options are on the table. There's a lot of hybrid going on, and, and hopefully that proves to go better maybe than it did in the spring for a lot of districts. And, of course, anybody who's in a school building is going to have to comply with all of the safety measures, and that includes children. Maybe not the itty-bitties who won't have to wear a mask, but from third up. Third grade and up. Third grade and up have to wear a mask. In Orleans Parish, it's kindergarten and up. Um, And there are daily temperature checks. So all these things Mm -hmm. that will be factored into the school day, getting your temperature checked when you arrive in the morning, having hand washing stations. So you'll have to wash your hands at least every two hours, plus when you arrive and before and after you eat. Um, A lot of changes. And sports and extracurriculars not really happening. Bands and choruses, vocal and band performances, not at least until phase three. Sports teams, it's a little different. You can practice, but you can't play other teams. It, it, it's, it, it yeah. depends on what source you go to. You get different answers. You know, uncharted waters is what the state superintendent of education described it as. Um, uncharted waters, and it really is for us all. all right. Well, and there aren't really mandates. There are just guidelines. Right. All right. So. Okay. Thanks a lot, Don. Mike, over to you. We've seen an uptick in shootings in Orleans Parish, and it's really causing a bit of concern. Yes, both shootings and killings, which is the last thing you want to see during a deadly global pandemic, especially one that's been hitting Louisiana and New Orleans so hard. Uh, But there is a link, and uh, Chief Sean Ferguson did, you know, theorize that the stress on people just, you know, being uh, stuck at home in a lot of instances and being out of a job and economic stress has related to stress on the street. We're up about, um, I believe it's close to 40% uh, from last year's numbers on both homicides and uh, non-fatal shootings. Uh, Troubling trend, you know, to be fair, the number of homicides last year was a 40-year low of 119. Mm -hmm. We are now uh, approaching that and probably will per- surpass that mark in August. I think we're just closing it on 110 right now. Um, but once again, with uh, crime trends, there are so many factors involved that it's hard to tease out exactly, you know, 
what degree the economic stress with so many people out of work yeah. because of the pandemic is the cause of this. But there is no doubt uh, people are stressed. And then one thing that we do know is that there is a snowball effect in which uh, a shooting or killing often leads to retaliation. Mm -hmm. And when you get a string at a bad stretch like we've had this summer, uh, you can expect more. And officers are vigilant. They are well aware. They're, you know, in addition to trying to solve the shootings and killings, they're, you know, getting the names of the players who might be the a next target of retaliation. Uh, there are a couple other factors I want to bring up. And of course, you know, once again, it's hard criminologists to take years to study all these factors, but we have had uh, the uh, dismantling of the task forces. Those were those proactive units in each individual district that really tried to, you know, spot crime trends, hit hot spots, and attack, you know, crime before it really escalated into uh, gunplay. And on top of that, the Black Lives Matter, um, you know, obviously George Floyd video and, and so many others, which have led to nationwide protests about, um, you know, inequality in policing, have maybe, um, you know, led to officers being much more cautious, much less likely to be proactive, even without the task forces. So uh, many factors are involved, but it is absolutely a, a troubling trend. Yeah. Um, and the police department acknowledges that. And then also, just really quickly, I mean, we've seen several of these shootings happen on the I-10. So that's assuming these people are shooting each other in moving cars. Is that what's happening there? Yeah. So what that tells detectives is rather than a, you know, spontaneous, say, argument that blows up some kind of like a heat of passion type shooting, that those are most likely people who have been targeted, mm -hmm. uh, once again, going back to the retaliation style shootings, in which someone's been on the lookout for someone who's deemed an enemy, um, or in many cases, you know, payback for mm -hmm. some earlier, you know, act of violence. And if they spot them while driving, even on the interstate along I-10, that's where they're going to pull out the gun and open fire. With presumably so, other cars yes. and other people in those cars around them. So that, that's pretty scary. Right. That definitely is. Right. Uh, obviously, you know, any shooting in what they call sort of like open air, whether it's the street or mm -hmm. moving cars, you know, you can have right. completely innocent victims, um, you know, that get in the line of right. fire. And as, that's a, we, we've seen some instances of seen. that, of course, right. with, yeah. with the nine-year-old. Right. Um, shot a month ago, so okay. tragic. All righty, Mike. Thanks a lot. We're going to come back to you a little bit to talk about consent decrees. Right now, I'm going over to Errol, and certainly the COVID pandemic has shut down businesses and so much of what goes on normally in this metro region. So how's our economy going to revive? Well, yesterday there was a, a forum. There, there are many forums going on. But the one yesterday was uh, actually it was hosted by The Advocate, and it had some of the business leaders talking about it. And they're there are a lot of observations, but a couple that come to mind is that really early there was talk about we can't be too heavily dependent on tourism. Um, that New Orleans, someone pointed out, is like number three in terms of dependency on tourism. And, and, and you can't do that and really kind of build your economy more. When I, when I saw that, though, it reminded me of in the 1970s, there was an economist at UNO, uh, Dean James Bobo, who did this big economic report. It was really got a lot of publicity. And the first thing he said is that we can't be too reliant on tourism. We need to diversify. Now, in his day, he was talking about manufacturing. And people were saying, yeah, we need more manufacturing. Everybody was looking towards Eastern New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Let's get manufacturing. Fact is, manufacturing, other than Dixie beer, hasn't really come. And it's not, it's not happening in the United States. We're not a manufacturing um, country anymore. So what they were saying yesterday is that we can't rely as much on tourism, but there are other things. There's, uh, there's the port, there's supplying, and there's, and there's shipping. And Brandy Christian of, the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the Port Authority pointed out that there have been studies of big industries that get a lot of their manufacturing done in China. And like one-third are saying that when this is over, they're going to look elsewhere for their manufacturing. 
in one place they're looking at is Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it's named, well, all of a sudden, if you got a lot more manufacturing in Mexico, then that's going to put a lot of the shipment into the Gulf of Mexico. And that helps New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And that New Orleans can really develop even more than it is, but, but, but not just in terms of the boats, but in terms of the supply and the shipment, because we have railroads and we have right. rivers, canals. And so that might be one way to go. Another thing they talked about is really trying to get the universities to connect more with the medical community because there's a need for a lot of jobs that are medically related. And so maybe the, uh, the, uh, the universities can do uh, more with that. So we'll see what changes lie ahead for us um, in terms of our economy. Yeah, but um, the one thing about, they shouldn't put down tourism though, because right. our tourism is natural. Yes. What we offer here is the real thing. I mean, we have a real culture and a real history here, whereas a lot of people try to manufacture something right. that'd be a tourist attraction. We have the real deal. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, E. Mike, I'm going to go back over to you for a quick look at consent decrees, NOPD, jail. Where do we stand with those now? Well, once again, I think I used this phrase before, it's the tale of two consent decrees, and they seem to be going slightly in opposite directions with uh, the jail consent decree actually, you know, making some progress. The big news uh, was that Marlon Gussman, the elected sheriff, finally gets to take over and run his own jail. It has been run for the better part of five years by a compliance director. So that um, Darnley Hodge, the current compliance director, will be phasing out, making the transition to Gussman. Now, that by no means means that the jail is out of the woods. The last uh, monitor's report on the jail was decidedly mixed. They have a, a long ways mm -hmm. to go before they are in compliance enough to lift that consent decree. And there's also now the biggest looming problem is what to do with inmates in need of mental health care. Mm -hmm. There had been a plan for a phase three. Uh, that's been taken off the table by Mayor Cantrell. Now they're looking for how that can be accomplished. Mm -hmm. Now on the NOPD side, they've taken some steps backwards. Obviously the uh, task forces, which I mentioned earlier, have been dismantled, and that was dismantled um, by the police department right before a scathing audit by their compliance um, monitors, showing just a, a lot of problems, even some of the core constitutional policing issues. There will be an announcement soon on what the police department's plan is to bring back proactive policing in some other form. But that was a setback. And then I had a story last night that there's been slippage in the area of off-duty uh, details, those right. you know, side security jobs that many officers work. In this instance, a uh, veteran lieutenant was allowed to stay on as a supervisor of one of the most lucrative details in the whole city, even though he's under investigation for not one, but two different <coughs> um, complaints. And that has led you know, and they got him removed from the 8th District, where the detail is, the French mm -hmm. Quarter Task Force. So a lot of criticism and possibly a violation of that consent decree, which says that once officers are reassigned while under investigation, they can no longer work the details. So mm -hmm. he was not only working a detail, he was working a $40,000 a year uh, detail as a supervisor over officers in the 8th District when he had been removed for actually a sexual harassment complaint of an underling in that 8th district. Okay, so still issues of concern with the NOPD regarding the consent decree. Right. Okay, all right. And neither, of those, neither of those consent decrees are uh, about to be lifted in yeah. 2020, I can tell you that. Okay, thanks a lot, Mike. Errol, over to you. The Pelicans, will they or won't they? Um, maybe. Um, the Pelicans are sort of like in a pre-playoff playoff, and they need to finish in the top eight in their division to make the final playoffs. Right now they're number 12. They've been a little disappointing. They're, they're one in three. However, they do have a shot of making it to number eight. They have some fair, they're playing some of the weaker teams now, so they could make it, but it's, uh, it's disappointing. It's going to be a little bit of a long shot. Everybody's looking at Zion Williamson, who's been everything people expected as far as his shooting, his offensive play. Hasn't quite been there on the defensive side, so the team needs to gel a little bit, but the next few days will tell. Um, so when is it that they play again? They play again tonight. They do play and, and, tonight. And so tonight, if they lose tonight, you can pretty much write it off. Right. I mean, they're still in, but they're going to, it's going to be hard. So they played last night and allowed more points than Last they ever night had? was disgusting. 
they got <laughs> trounced. And they've had two games where they lost by huge totals. And they had one game where they lost and the ball just bounced the wrong way off the rim. So their, their defense has been disappointing. But they, they still remain. They still have a chance. They have a chance. But tonight is really the make or break is what you're telling us. It's going to break if they lose tonight, yeah. Okay, doke. They're, they're playing the Washington Wizards, which is one of the weak teams in the league. So if they lose to Washington, may as well go home. Forget it for the season, <laughs> huh? Okay, I'm going to stick with you because there are other stories that happened. Um, so let's go around the table and starting with you. Well, we just want to acknowledge kind of on a personal level of the death of Herschel Abbott. Herschel Abbott was involved throughout the community. Uh, he chaired many, many boards, St. Thomas Community uh, um, Center, uh, the BGR, Dillard. And to us, he was, he'd been chairman of WYS. It's one thing to be on a mm -hmm. board. It's the other thing to get out in front and raise money. And he was always very effective with that. He took on a lot of causes. And look, it's the people who are on boards and who are raising money and who are supporting, it's the nonprofit people who are really supporting the community. And he was one of the greats. Yeah, and he was really instrumental in getting the National World War II Museum to be a reality. He was a real big supporter and organizer for it at the very start. A real activist so, with that. Yeah, we have a lot to be thankful for. So our condolences, of course, to his family. Um, okay, Don, let's go over to you. It's not a story to be watching. It's more a, a plug for all of our restaurants who have been so hard hit by this um, and are usually hard hit in the summer also with travel slowing down, that they're running all sorts of August culinary specials, three, right. you know, three course meals. You can get them for takeout and go ahead and keep our restaurants up and running. When we talked about tourism before, that's a big part of how people or why people want to come see us. Absolutely. So dinners and lunches, so too, eat. some of them. Yes. All yeah. right. Always ready to do that, huh, Don? All right. Gordon, over to you. So real quick, I'll mention a story that we posted this afternoon. It was very controversial when the Louisiana Supreme Court decided to waive the bar exam for this year's mm -hmm. law school graduates uh, because they weren't going to be able to take the bar exam in person. They said you could have diploma privilege, meaning that you could practice without passing the bar. It turns out one of the beneficiaries of that decision was uh, the daughter of one of our Supreme Court justices, and this was a very controversial 4-3 uh, vote on the court. So uh, that's right. a story to, to make sure you catch up on. Yes, yeah, so we'll take a look at that. Thing. Thanks, Gordon. Mike, quickly to you. Yes, yeah, so uh, Jason Williams, in addition to running for district attorney, he's fighting a federal tax fraud indictment, and this week held a hearing on a motion to dismiss that indictment. The judge, Martin Feldman, took that under advisement. Uh, there's you know, no timetable on when he is going to issue his ruling, okay. but he did indicate that it would be sooner rather than later, so we'll wait to see if that case is dismissed, because, which would be a long shot, or proceed to trial. Because there is an election coming up. Okay, guys, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening.